California the other day and uh, I was doing a, an event with uh, Governor Schwarzenegger. He and I have many similar attributes, as you can tell. <laughs> and there's always protesters in California. And there's a great big guy standing there with a sign. And he looked at me and I walked by and he said, hey, anybody ever tell you you look a lot like Senator John McCain? <laughs> I said, yeah, and he said, doesn't it just make you mad as heck? So, uh, for, your, for your kind introduction, I'd, uh, like, I bring greetings from your 1,600 co-workers in the great state of Arizona. It's a tad warm today, but come back in December and it'll be about 75 when it's uh, a little cold here. So, uh, when also in Arizona, we have so little water, the trees chase the dogs, and so, uh, 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 here when it's been raining a lot here, I understand. Uh, also, I'd like to ask your sympathy for the families of the state of Arizona because uh, Barry Goldwater from Arizona ran for President of the United States, and Morris Udall from Arizona ran for President of the United States, and Bruce Babbitt from Arizona ran for President of the United States, and I from Arizona ran for President of the United States. Arizona may be the only state in America where mothers don't tell their children that someday they can grow up and be President of the United States. <laughs> I ask your sympathy. Uh, as a United States Senator, however, it's not unusual. I had a friend of mine who was a House member once who said, if you're a United States Senator, unless you are under indictment or detoxification, you automatically consider yourself a candidate for President of the United States, and I think that's true. Now, I'd like to mention about three issues with you very quickly because I think most of you came here because you wanted to hear, me to hear from you as well as as you hear from me. Uh, the first thing I'd like to talk to you about, of course, is uh, as a Republican, we Republicans lost the last election and lost power. And a lot of people think that the reason for that is because of the war in Iraq. Uh, I don't think so. I think that Joe Lieberman, who was a senator from a very liberal state of Connecticut, was reelected with his support of the war. And I'll talk to you about Iraq here and end up my comments talking about it. But what I think caused the Republicans to lose the last election was because whether you're Republican or Democrat, we uh, in Washington allowed spending to go completely out of control. We, we spent money in a fashion which is almost unprecedented. We presided over the greatest increase in the size of government since the Great Society. And we did it in a terrible fashion because it was your tax dollars, it was your money, and we began to believe it was ours. We Republicans came to power in 1994 to change government, and government changed us. You know, I often say that Congress spends money like a drunken sailor, only I never knew a sailor drunk or sober with the imagination of some of my colleagues. Now, that's a kind of a funny line, and it gets a chuckle, but you know, I'm not making this up when I tell you that about a month ago, I received an email from a guy and it said, as a former drunken sailor, I resent being compared to members of Congress. <laughs> and, and you know, we did, we did screwy things. We, we spent three million dollars to study the DNA of bears in Montana. I don't know if that was a paternity issue or a criminal issue. <laughs> and, and the fact is that we, we really did uh, abandon our stewardship of your hard-earned, hard-earned dollars. And uh, we paid a price for it. And Americans on our Republican base became angry as, as well as they should. The tipping point, my friends, was when we passed a bill that, uh, that, was gonna, that spent $233 million of your tax dollars for, on a bridge in Alaska to an island with 50 people on it. And that was a tipping point. And that's when our people became disenchanted. And that's why, in my view, why we lost the last election. But most importantly to you is that I promise you, as President of the United States, the first bill that comes across my desk that has one of these pork barrel projects on it, I will veto it, and I will make the authors of it famous. You will know their names. It's got to stop. It's got to stop, and it will stop when I am President of the United States. And the second thing I want to assure you of, we'll balance the budget. We'll balance the budget, and we'll do what's necessary. I want to be President of the United States because I want to do the hard things, not the easy things. We're going to have to fix Social Security. We're going to have to fix Medicare. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to do the hard things. I see a lot of young people in this audience. Here's some straight talk, my friends. 
you will not receive the same social security benefits on your retirement that present day retirees have. Don't we have an obligation to fix it so that you do? Don't we, don't we as your elected representatives have an obligation to fix that system? When this system started out, there was 13, there was 16 workers for, uh, uh, re workers for every retiree. Now it's three workers for every retiree. By the time you retire, it's gonna be two workers for every retiree. You don't have, I stood fifth from the bottom of my class at the Naval Academy, but even I can figure out that kind of math. Okay. By the way, if my old company officer were here today, he'd say in America, anything is possible. But that, so, so I wanna do the hard things. Medicare is going broke too. We, we, ha we have to fix that as well, and I'll be glad to talk uh, about those with you. But I wanna do the hard things. Now let me talk about the hard thing with you that we're doing right now, and that's immigration reform. Now, my friends, let's start out. I think we would all agree that it is a national security issue to have 12 million people in our country who are here illegally. We don't know where they are or what they're doing. So to do nothing, to do nothing and have the status quo remain what it is, is not, is not fair to America. It's a national security issue. And you send us there to solve problems, to sit down Republican and Democrat together and work these things out. The easiest thing I know to do as a, as, as a United States Senator is to say no. The hardest thing is to sit down across the aisle with the leadership of this president and come up with a solution to a situation which is untenable. Three of the people, that tried to attack Fort Dix, New Jersey and kill American servicemen and women came across our southern border illegally. So since 9-11, this is a national security issue. And to just say no, in my view, is not, uh, is not the way to approach it. Now, I don't wanna bother you with all the details, but I wanna assure you that everybody in this room wants our borders secure. Wants our borders secure, that's an obligation. And many of our people are angry because in 1986 we passed a law where we gave amnesty to three million people and then and we said we'd secure the borders and we didn't. Our borders are broken. Our borders, are, I come from the state, I, I, I take it from me. 51% of the people who cross our border from Mexico and the United States of America cross the Arizona border. Hundreds have died in the desert. We have coyotes and shootouts on our freeways, so with coyotes. Uh, a, a policeman two summers ago opened up the door of a horse trailer in Phoenix, there were 73 people jammed inside, one of them a six months old child. Th th this, is, this is an issue we've got to sit down and resolve. And it's not by giving amnesty. Amnesty means forgiveness. What we're trying to do is basically say, look, we'll secure the borders, we'll hire 20,000 border patrol agents, we'll build fences, we'll use UAVs, we'll use sensors, and we'll secure the border, and it's gonna take us at least 18 months to do it, and after that 18 months, there has to be certification that our border is secure. Then we move to a temporary worker program, and we also put people who are here illegally in a probationary status. Now, you got two choices. You can round up the 12 million people and deport them, and I know no one who knows how you do that, or, you do something short of that. Now, what are we doing to the people? Because they have broken our laws by crossing our borders illegally. They have to pay a fine. They have to have a background check. They have to learn English. They have to go back to the country of their origin before they can come back in. It would take at least, at least 13 months before they would have even a, a real opportunity to become citizens. And they have to be working and they can't break our laws. And if they break our laws, then they're deported or they're put in jail.